Alrighty, uh, let's all stand again. Our last song is my favorite of the day on page 281. In Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 27, it says, The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms, and he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee, and shall say, Destroy them. The everlasting arms, leaning on the everlasting arms, page 281. Isaiah chapter 14. Everybody knows that this is the chapter, uh, you know, about Lucifer. And uh, in Isaiah chapter 14, uh, we're going to start in verse 4. In verse 4 it says, That thou shalt take up this Proverbs against the king of Babylon, and say, How doth the oppressor, how hath the oppressor ceased? The golden city ceased. The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of the rulers. He who smote the people in wrath with a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing, yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. All they shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. And the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. 
They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble and did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? All the kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch, as the raiment of those that are slain, thrust through with a sword, that go down to the stones of the pit, as a carcass trodden under feet. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land, and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renewed. Prepare slaughter for his children, for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities. For I will raise up against them, saith the Lord of hosts, and cut off from Babylon the name and remembrance and son and nephew, saith the Lord. I will also make it a possession for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with a besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. Let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for bringing us all together here today to learn your word and more about you and to praise your holy name and to worship you. I pray that you be with each and every one of us, Lord, and I pray you be with me and fill me with your spirit to preach your word with truth and boldness the way you would want me to. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I read a lot of that chapter, but the main verses that I want to... Uh, look at today is uh, verses 12 through 14. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which did, didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. You know, a lot of people believe that there's some kind of, uh, you know, battle between Satan and God. And, you know, that's just not the case. Uh, God is in control. And the devil can't do anything unless God allows it. We learn that in the book of Job. You don't have to turn there. I've got it marked in my Bible. But we learn that in the book of Job that uh, Satan can't do anything unless God allows it. But a lot of people believe that there's some kind of, you know, battle against God and Satan. And, you know, it's either God or Satan. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's just not the case. God is in control. Satan has no power over God whatsoever. And in Job uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12, it says... Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there was none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And over in chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? And he still holdeth fast his integrity, 
although thou movedest me against him to destroy him without cause. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. God is telling Satan there what he can do and what he can't do, not the other way around. Uh, you notice in uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says that Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. You know, God isn't presenting himself before Satan. Satan is presenting himself before God. Satan has no power over God whatsoever. Zero. And I just wanted to make that clear. Over here in Isaiah chapter 14, you know, the, the word Lucifer is only in the Bible one time. And uh, that's not a name for Satan, in case you guys are wondering. We all know him as Lucifer. If you ask somebody who's Lucifer, they're going to tell you Satan. But that's not really his name. Lucifer does mean uh, the shining one or the brightness. In Ezekiel chapter 28, the other account of a major prophet of Satan. You don't have to turn there. I got it marked in my Bible. Ezekiel chapter 28. In verse 13 it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was thy covering, the sardust, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, and the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle. And gold, the workmanship of thy tab rays, and of thy pipes was prepared in thee in the day that thou was created. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. And thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground, I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. It says, by reason of thy brightness. That's what Lucifer means, uh, the shiny one or the bright one. And that's uh, just like a nickname, but, you know, we know his name is the devil, Satan, the old serpent, as it says in the New Testament. Uh, you know, his name really isn't Lucifer, but, you know, we all acknowledge him as Lucifer. But that's the only time that's mentioned in the Bible, and it just means shining one. And I just wanted to go over that. Uh, if you would, go to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. While you're there, I'm going to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. If I can find it here. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 verse 14, it says, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into into an angel of light. That's another uh, example of what Lucifer means. It just means angel of light. But in Revelation chapter 12, Satan knows that there's nothing he can do against God. Just one verse here in uh, Revelation chapter 12, and that's verse 12. It says, Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them, woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. If you would go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Satan knows that he has just a short time. And there's nothing he can do that God will not let him do. Peter tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. That's in 1 Peter 5, 8. 
Uh, if you're there in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Satan cannot do nothing unless God lets him do that. Satan cannot do nothing against God, but he can against you and against me. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, or, uh, the Bible says he is as a roaring, lighter, roaring lion in 1 Peter 5, 8. You know, the Bible says that Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Revelation 5.5 5 and Genesis 49.9. Satan is always trying to be like God in your eyes. That's what it means back there in Isaiah chapter 14. He says, I will be like the Most High. He doesn't want to be God because he knows he can't be God. He knows that God is up here and he's just a created being. But he wants to be like God. Uh, we all know that he can't be God. He just wants to be like God. And that's all the Bible ever says. I will be like the Most High. But uh, Satan wants to be like God in your eyes. That's what he says when he says, I will be like the Most High. Back in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, it says, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. Who is the congregation? We are the congregation. Satan's plan as a roaring lion, is to sit and be worshipped from God's people. He wants to take the worship away from God and turn it to himself. He knows that he has but a little time. He doesn't have nothing. His time is limited. So all he can do is take from God what God wants, and that's our worship. If you're there in 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, in verse 3 it says, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Notice that it says, after the working of Satan. In Revelation chapter 13 verses 2 to 4 it says that they worshipped the dragon. And then in verse 8 it says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. If you would go to Luke chapter 4. It says, after the working of Satan. You know, Satan, uh, is after the worship. It says, all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. They're talking about the beast. They're not talking about Satan. But in 2 Thessalonians, the part I wanted you to fixate on was, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders. Satan doesn't need you to worship him. All he needs you to do is change your worship from God to something else. If you're there in Luke chapter 4, in Luke chapter 4, down in verse 6, it says, And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Satan here is uh, after worship.
The devil wants the worship that God desires. I had another note here. That's why I was pausing. I forgot what that was about, so just bear with me. The devil wants the worship that God deserves. You know, people may say or think, I don't worship the devil. But according to that verse we just read, you know, maybe not directly. We don't have to, uh, people don't have to worship Satan directly. Because it says uh, that all was given to him, you know, in the earth. Uh, the devil can get what he wants indirectly. And that's a fact. Because all has been given, he's the God of this world. All you have to do is worship the world. The Bible says in James 4, uh, that whosoever is a friend of the world is the enemy of God. In Revelation chapter 14, verse 11, it says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. The beast is not the devil. You know, that's an unholy trinity. Uh, Satan and the beast and the Antichrist, they're trying to copy God. That's all Satan does all throughout the Bible is try to copy God. Like it says, he's as a roaring lion. Jesus is the lion of uh, the tribe of Judah. It's all about copying uh, God. And God wants our worship, and Satan is trying to steal that away. The uh, title of my message is, We Know Who Wins. We Know Who Wins. It's, the beast is not the devil. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. The false prophet and the beast have already been in hell for a thousand years. And, you know, so that's not, the beast is not Satan. But he tricked people into worshiping the beast. And uh, back there in uh, 2, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says, The workings of him came after the power of Satan. You know, I'm paraphrasing there. But it's all in Satan's hands. He's the one that's controlling all of that mess. That was in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders... In Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, it says, They worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. They're worshipping the dragon while they're worshipping the beast. Satan is getting what he wants indirectly. And that's another trick of Satan. So when they say, well, I don't worship the devil, you know, well, you don't have to worship him directly. It's indirectly. If you would go to Romans chapter 1. The devil doesn't have to get you to worship him directly. The Bible says he is the God of this world. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, we just read in, chapter, in, in Luke chapter 4, verse 6. The devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them. For that is delivered unto me, and whosoever I will, I give it. See, all he has to do is trick you and to get you to worship something other than then God the Father, then God the Son, then God the Holy Ghost. All he has to do is trick you into worshiping something else. You know, just as a side note, uh, you know, these oneness, self-loving Pentecostals who don't believe in the Trinity, how could that happen there in Luke chapter 4? How can Satan try to tempt God the Father? He can't. They believe that Jesus is God the Father, and there is no God the Son, they're just one. You know, so think about that for a second. You know, how can Satan uh, try to tempt God the Father? You know, he can't do nothing against God the Father. We already learned that back in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2. But how he does that here to Jesus because Jesus humbled himself and became a man. Uh, like we read in uh, the book of Hebrews. In all points, he was like unto his brethren. That's how Satan was able to tempt Jesus because Jesus was hungry. He didn't eat for 40 days and 40 nights. He was starving to death. And Satan, you know, but Satan can never tempt God the Father. Uh, it says that, you know, he cannot be tempted, neither he tempteth any man. 
you know, but, you know, just, just something to think about for these uh, oneness Pentecostals that believe God is just one and there is no Trinity, you know. Let them read uh, Luke chapter 4 and see how Satan tries to tempt Jesus. You know, Satan knows what's up. He knows his time is coming. He knows who God the Father is, you know. But that's just a side note for free. Uh, I'm sure they'll twist, uh, you know, some kind of way to get around that. If you ever watch any videos or any Pentecostal preaching, uh, there's a lot that they tiptoe around and, and, and rest the words of God. You know, but in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 6, it says, But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Did I, I, I didn't already read that, did I? Already. Uh, if he's the God of this world, all he has to do is worship things in the world. All he has to do is trick you to worship things in the world because he's the God of this world. Uh, some people uh, are tricked into worshiping other things. And that's all the power of Satan because he's the God of this world. Some people worship money. Uh, a lot of people do in this world. You know, money is their only goal in life to see how much money they can get or the things that they can get. Some people worship their house. And I know that because, you know, I'm in people's houses every single day doing works. And some people, that's all they do. Uh, you go into their house and there's not a speck of dust. Everything's perfect. And when you go in there, you better do a perfect job or they're going to be upset because all they care about is their house. Uh, morning, noon, and night, all they care about is their house. Uh, a lot of people worship sports. You know, I've been over that quite a few times. Uh, a lot of people worship hobbies, whatever it may be, like hunting or fishing. Uh, you know, which is a sport, but it's really a hobby, or, or whatever it may be, jogging. Uh, you know, just their hobbies. Some people uh, worship food. You know, a lot of people worship food. Uh, nowadays, the biggest thing I think people worship is their phone. You know, it's just, it's just crazy. Uh, you take somebody's phone away and their, their life is over. You know? A lot of people worship pets. And... Uh, you know, don't get me wring on this, but uh, you know, I see people walking behind their pets every single day picking up droppings with their hand. And that's just crazy in my eyes. I just can't understand somebody walking behind an animal picking up their uh, poop. That's just crazy. You know, if, if I had to pick up poop with my hand, I would not have an animal. You know, get a cat. They'll bury it. You know, but that's just crazy. Some people worship pets. You know, but the worst of all is worshiping ourselves. Satan said, I will be like the Most High. It's pride. Right in the middle of the pride is the word I. God hates pride. The worst thing that people worship in this world is themselves. Uh, you know, the mark of the beast is the number of man, 666. You know, man was created on the sixth day and so on. The number of man is the mark of the beast, 666. That's the number of a man. That's who uh, most people in this world worship themselves, man. They're worshiping man. Uh, people only care about themselves. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, nothing, Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. You know, the, the second commandment from Jesus is love thy neighbor as thyself. It doesn't say love thyself as thyself. You know, it says love your neighbor as yourself. Look after other people. In Romans chapter 1, look down at verse number 24. It says, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator, who was blessed forever and ever. You know, God said, uh, or Jesus said, uh, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But this right here says, uh, worshiped and served the creature more than the creator. The creature is us. He is the creator. We are the creature. 
Uh, they worship the creature more than they did God. You know, just to be a little vague here, what this is saying here in Romans chapter 1, uh, if we keep on reading, in verse 26 it says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. It says, For this cause. Being a homo is a curse from God, because it says right there in verse 26, For this cause. God gave them up. Being a homosexual is a curse from God. You can see these people out here lusting for the, you know, each other, men with men, or women with women. That's a curse from God. Uh, when all you care about is yourself, like it says in verse 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another. Men with, win, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. That's a curse from God. And I could not think of a worse curse. Uh, that, but that's clearly what that's saying. And you know, I'm not saying that every uh, person who says uh, that they're gay or something like that can't be saved. But two people lusting after each other after the same sex is, uh, that's a curse from God. And it says that they're reprobates. Uh, we can't see people's heart, but God does. And that's a curse from God. And they cannot be saved because reprobate means rejected by God. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 30. A reprobate silver shall men call them because they have been rejected by God. Uh, you know, and the Bible is written this way, just so you know, it's not very uh, uh, frank, uh, so everybody can read this, even young ones. And that's why it's written like this, but it clearly says men with men or women with women. So that's a curse from God. Because they loved and worshipped themselves more than God. So that's a curse from God. Uh, Find out where I'm at here. If you would go to John chapter 4. Like I said, the title of this message is, We Know Who Wins. The battle is for worship. Uh, the word worship comes 108 times in the Bible. Not all those times means worshiping God, but, you know, worshiping false gods and stuff like that. But the battle is for worship, even for Christians. You know, God seeking, uh, the devil is, uh, as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He can trick Christians into worshiping other things like themselves or money or, uh, you know, their hobbies, things like that. The battle is for worship. People say that I don't worship the devil. I go to church. You know, people that can still go to church and be worshiping the things of the world, which is still worshiping Satan, because Satan is the god of this world. Uh, if you're there in John chapter 4, get there real quick. John chapter 4, we're going to be in verse 19. John chapter 4 and verse 19, it says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship. See, Jesus is telling her, we know what we worship, you know, but she's going to that mountain to worship. Uh, she's going to church to worship, but Jesus says, you know not what you worship. So people can go to church and still not know what they worship. You know, I was in uh, Burlington uh, about four years ago. Uh, we was driving down through there, and we seen this parade coming down uh, the side of the street. So we kind of slowed down to look at it. Well, it turns out uh, in front of this big, long line of people, which is probably a couple thousand people, walking down the street, these four men 
was each carrying a pole with this platform above their head and it had a statue of Mary on it. It was some kind of, uh, you know, Mary worship. They was walking down the street, a couple thousand people worshiping Mary. You know, where do you find that in the Bible? You can't. Uh, you know, I was at a customer's house a few years ago, and uh, he was a friend of mine, and I was asking him if he knew 100% for sure that he was going to heaven. And he says, yes, I do. And I was like, well, how do you know that? He goes, well, I go out there and pray to Mary every single morning. He had a statue of Mary in his front yard. I was like, where do you find that in the Bible? You know, the first thing I said to him was, have you ever heard the first commandment? And he thought for a few minutes, and he had no idea what the first commandment was. You know, that's what most, most Catholics are. Everybody uh, in here I know, uh, even Gracine has memorized the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is, thou shalt have no other God before me. You know, I mean, it's just that simple, but he didn't know. He was out there praying to Mary every single morning. And that's how he thought he was going to get saved. Uh, the end of that story is, next time I came to his house, that statue was gone, just so you know. Uh, he never did convert. Uh, he, he wouldn't get saved because he's still stuck on all that doctrine, but he got rid of that statue. You know, so maybe at least some of that stuck in. You know, I was in a, uh, uh, or at a customer's house just a couple of months ago, and I was up on his roof, and it was right next to a Catholic church, and I looked up there, and there's these three uh, uh, men, I guess you would call them, walking down the street doing a prayer walk with their little beads, wearing long dresses down to the ground. Three men in dresses doing a prayer walk, uh, praying to the rosary beads. Where do you find that in the Bible? People can go to church and think that they're worshiping God, but they're not. They're worshiping Satan because that's a trick of the devil. They think that they're doing God's work, but they're really worshiping Satan. Uh, in verse 22b, it says, For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers uh, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. God wants our worship. Uh, and the battle is for our worship. And that's what, that's what Satan wants. But God wants our worship. It says right there that uh, the Father seeketh such to worship him. You know, it says it right there in verse 23. Uh, you know, we all got, get caught up in our daily lives, uh, you know, through the week, uh, going through our daily lives and forget about God. It's easy to do. You know, I get in a big rush and get aggravated at work and uh, get in heavy traffic and I forget it. You know, but God seeks our worship. And uh, that's not just on Sunday. We go through our daily lives and we, you know, we start to forget about God. And, you know, that's why we have church on Wednesdays, in case you guys don't know. It's because that gives us a break through the middle of the week when we can get back to where we need to be. And that's what the Wednesday service, Wednesday service is all about. Uh, if we just came once a week, that's too long of a time span for most people. Most people don't worship God morning, noon, and night. Uh, you know, uh, most people uh, get caught up in their daily lives, and then, you know, we come to church for an hour or two or three as a routine. You know, most people go to church today, if you go into a lot of these churches, and they just go there because it's a routine. When we went to Harvest, there was a lady there that had dementia. She couldn't do anything, but she could go to church uh, every Sunday. Isn't that amazing? Because she's been doing it her whole life, and that's just a routine. And thank God for that. You know, she had dementia. She had no idea where she was most of the time. But she could get in a car and drive to church because she had been doing it her whole life. Uh, most people today go to church because it's just a routine. Not to worship God. They just get stuck in that routine and do it over and over again. Well, it's Sunday. Uh, it's my day to go to church. You know, they're not really going to God, uh, going to church to worship God. And that's what we go to church for is to worship God and to learn more about Him. You know, the, remember the first time any of you had a crush on somebody? Or the first time you fell in love? How, uh, you know, that person was all you could think about 
morning, noon, and night. Uh, we've all been there. You know, that's worship. When you think about somebody morning, noon, and night, every day of the week, 24 hours a day, you know, you go to sleep and have dreams about them. That's what worship is. Worship isn't just going, well, I guess I better go to church because it's Sunday. You know, worship is going to church because you want to go to church and worship God. That's what worship is. Uh, you know, do you have a crush on God? Uh, is he in your thoughts morning, noon, and night? Uh, you know, like somebody that you had a crush on, you know, when you was young. How that person was just in your thoughts morning, noon, and night. And you couldn't think about anything else. That's how you worship God. And that's what all of us as Christians need to do. We need to worship God. You know, he needs to be our crush or the love of our life. Uh, Jesus says, you know, if you don't hate your father, mother, and children, you're not worthy to be my disciple. You know, I'm paraphrasing there. I can't quote that verbatim, but that's what he says. You know, you know, all of our thoughts need to be on Jesus. That's what worship is. You know, the Bible says that Enoch walked with God. He wasn't actually walking next to God, you know, because the Bible says that nobody has seen the face of God and lived. By, uh, Enoch didn't die. He was translated. You know, so he wasn't actually walking next to God. No, he walked his daily life with God. All of his thoughts, all of his love, you know, all of his worship went straight to God. That's how you walk with God, and that's what Christians need to be like today. We need to walk with God every single day, not just one, two, or three hours a week, uh, 24 hours a day. You know, God needs to be our worship, and that's how we worship God, and that's what he wants. The battle is for our worship. And if we're not worshiping God 24 hours a day, then we're worshiping other things. You know, we got the cares of this world above our worship for God. And God wants our worship 24 hours a day. Uh, God was in Enoch's thoughts morning, noon, and night. You know, the Bible talks about Job, how he was a perfect and upright man, feared God, and eschewed evil. That's another way that we worship God. We fear him. That's respect. And we eschew evil. Every time something evil comes in our life, we just get away from it. And we keep our focus on God. That's another how, way how we uh, worship God. You know, uh, we got Enoch, Job, Daniel, Samuel, David, Noah, and even Paul. Their whole life was all about God, nothing else. Uh, you know, Noah built an ark for over 100 years just because God said so. Just because he had faith in God. You know, that's 100 years. Uh, we're lucky if we live 80 years. You know, but he's doing what God told him to do for over 100 years straight without any variance. That's amazing. Uh, these are our examples on how to worship God. The battle is for our worship. And, you know, we can read from the Bible these examples of these men right here on how to worship God. Their whole life revolved around God, nothing else. Uh, do you look forward to reading your Bible? You know, that's why we don't have study Bibles. Uh, because when I read the Bible, I just want it to be me and God. When you have these study Bibles that are contradicting the Word of God or telling you what, uh, God, uh, what the Word of God is supposed to mean, it's not just you and God sitting down together, you and His Word. It's you and then somebody else telling you what uh, God meant. Now, you need, we need to worship God, sit down with His Word, uh, just between us and God. You know, so study Bibles, there's, you know, some study Bibles are, they have their uses. You know, but God wants us to sit down with just Him and His Word. No in-between man, uh, you know, blocking us from Him and uh, us. Uh, do you look forward to coming to church? That's another way that we worship God. It's only three hours of the week, you know, basically. Uh, you know, there's a lot of hours in the week. But do we only worship God just three hours a week? We need to do it uh, all week long, every day of the week. Do you look forward to coming to church? You know, you would if, uh, you know, if it was your crush or your first love, you know, uh, you'd be wanting to go to their house every day of the week. You'd be looking forward to seeing them. You know, do you look forward to seeing God or hearing God when we come to church? Or you just, will you just wake up and say, oh, it's Sunday again. I guess I better get up and go. 
No, we should look forward to going to church because that's who we go to worship. That should be the love of our life. You know, uh, do you look forward to being able to tell somebody about Jesus? That's another way we worship. God wants our worship, and the battle is for our worship. Do you look forward to telling somebody about Jesus? You know, I'm not trying to brag on myself or anything like that, but, you know, every time I go into somebody's house or I meet somebody, I'm looking for ways to give them the gospel because that's all I think about. How can I give this person the gospel and, give them sa and get them saved? That's because of Jesus. What Jesus did for me, you know, like the, uh, uh, the, the crazy man and, uh, uh, that had the legion of angels. You know, he said, go and tell all thy friends what God hath done for thee. You know, and that's what we should be doing. That's how we worship God, by telling other people about him. And, you know, when we don't tell other people about Jesus, then who are we worshiping? Ourselves. You know, we care more about ourselves than our neighbors. So worshiping God is telling other people about Jesus. You know, if you was in love with somebody, you'd be telling other people about them, about the one that you love, and you wouldn't have no reservations about that. Look, look who I got. You know, I, I love them so much. You know, do you feel that way about God? You're willing to tell other people about the love of your life? That's how we worship God. That's how we should worship God. If you're, there in, uh, if you're still there in uh, John chapter 4, look down at verse 22. It says, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Jesus is saying salvation is of the Jews there. And a lot of people want to take this verse and say that the Jews have some kind of free pass. Because they get free salvation like it says right there. But that's not what that's saying. Salvation of the Jews. We take the whole Bible into context. Especially when it comes to salvation. In Romans chapter 2 verse 28 it says. For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he, as a, but he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and that circumcision is of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. So it's their praise is of God. God is praising them for being a Jew in the heart, and the circumcision is of the heart, not the flesh. That means your heart is open to the gospel, to the words of God. Is God praising you? He would be if you was worshiping him, if you had a circumcised heart and you let all the love of God come in. Jesus says, unless you be converted and become as a little child, you can in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, a child doesn't have a stony heart. They just let whatever you tell them come in. And that's the way we need to be to worship God. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 3, it says, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. And have no confidence in the flesh. If all your confidence is in God, then you have no choice but to walk with him. Like Enoch did. Because there's no confidence in our, our flesh. All of our confidence has to be in God. And that's the way we need to walk as Christians. The battle is for our worship. And for the unsaved. You know, the unsaved, uh, it's easy for them to lust after the world. But us as Christians, if we're constantly worshiping God, he will keep us from the world. In Psalm chapter 132, verse 7, it says, We will go into his tabernacles. We will worship at his footstool. In Psalm 99, 9, it says, Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. In verse 5, it says, Exalt ye the Lord our God and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. In Psalm 96, verse 9, it says, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear him. Fear before him, all the earth. It's all about worshiping God. The battle is for our worship. In 1 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 29, it says, Give unto the Lord glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the beauty of holiness. If we're worshiping God in the beauty of holiness, that means to be set apart. That means our worship is set apart from the world. We worship God more than the world. And He is the love of our life. And many more verses.
throughout the Bible. I didn't want to write them all down. I could be here all day about uh, worshiping God. There's 108 of those verses, roughly thereabout, uh, all about worship. You know, the thing is to put God first. That's how we worship God. If we put him first in everything that we do, then we're worshiping God. You know, if we had some kind of hobby and all we thought about was going fishing every week, that'd be worship. But when we worship God, that's all we think about. Going to church, telling other people about Jesus, reading our Bible, uh, and, you know, telling other people about Jesus. That's worshiping God like we would if we was in love, uh, you know, for the first time. And, uh, you know, that's a hard thing to explain, but I'm sure everybody here has done it except for the kids. Hope so. You know, God is seeking such to worship him, like it says in John chapter 4 and verse 23. It says, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is seeking our worship, and he will praise us when we worship him. Uh, like it says in... Uh, Romans 2, 28, or 2, 29. He will give us his praise when we worship him. In 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9, it says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him, just like Job. That word perfect means complete. We need to give our complete worship to God. And, uh, you know, then he will praise us. I know I'm preaching to the choir today, but, uh, you know, this is what God gave me to preach.